And like a lot of other small farms, the families kind of dispersed to different places in the country and um, kind of the one that they left to kind of deal with things. And it's something I do, it's a passion I have, but uh, it's certainly not as profitable as it could be. You know, I don't want to reiterate your, your points, but uh, some of the things that we're doing on the farm now, um, like I said, we, you can't focus, you can't have just one stream of revenue. Because, like you said, the, we have the crop fed, any number of things can happen. Farming is probably the biggest gamble. Um, the cost of the inputs into the production have skyrocketed. A lot of people don't realize uh, when petroleum costs go up, and it costs more to fill up your tank, but people don't make the connection. Most of our fertilizers are petrol based. The baling twine, that you, you know, the big shredded wheat you see out in the fields. <laughs> The, the twine that bales those is oil based. The oil, the lube, all the equipment, so on and so forth. So that hits farmers even more so than other segments of the business community. Um, so what I decided to do was try and bring in as many streams of revenue to the farm as I could. But we, on the farm, we decided to introduce some new genetics into our, our cattle. And I don't know if you're familiar with Kobe beef. They're, they're really particular about calling anything not produced in Kobe, Japan, Kobe beef. So here in the U.S., it's called Wagyu. So what we've done is incorporate some of those genetics into our Black Angus line to increase the margin. And in Japan, what they do is they feed, I'm sure you may be familiar with this, but they feed them beer and give them massages and so on and so forth. <laughs> so my, see, my thought was, why not take some of this spent brewer's grain from the brewery and feed it to, to the cows. And so we formed a partnership with them where once a week, twice a week, we go out and, and get that. And that, that adds value to, to our line of beef. And it, it also gives them free publicity and kind of closes the loop within the community as far as the, 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 the money. Um, we're also doing, uh, started doing aquaculture. We've uh, begun to raise tilapia, channel catfish, and freshwater prawns. I never imagined I would be farming. Uh, I went to UAH. My background is biochemistry and microbiology. Uh, just, it just kind of happened. I don't see very many people that look like me on two counts, uh, being African-American farmers now, and as well as being my age, white, black, or otherwise. Uh, some of the other things that we're doing, I've partnered up with uh, Professor Ralph Midway at a &M, and and um, we're growing a line of uh, Indian staple crops to market to the Indian population here because they don't currently they don't have really have much access to some of those vegetables, the bitter gourd, obi, malabar spinach, things of that nature. They typically have to drive to Atlanta to procure that, or you know, purchase it from someone that, that made the trip themselves. And actually, here in town, A and M has a fully functioning. USDA certified processing facility with a full canning facility adjacent to it. The problem is, butchery is a, a dying art. It, uh, there's no one working. Oh, yeah, we pro provide some stuff to some, some local restaurants, kind of on an experimental basis now. Like I tell them right now, I want to uh, supplement rather than supplant your existing suppliers so that I don't put myself in that position. Small farmers have to be really careful about that, about not over promising. You know, because the chefs and the restaurants, they expect to have the product meet a certain minimal standard, and they expect to have it there when you say it's going to be there. And so that's the biggest hurdle, one of the hurdles that I've, I've come into, is just being able to be 